All right, we have a challenge right here on the creativity and social impact stage. And this is quite a unique moment in the scheme of the day because we are giving you the opportunity to put your creativity to work and actually win some really awesome prizes with it. So if you're a developer, if you're a designer and you want to get away for the weekend or maybe you want to uh, present your fantastic creative idea with lots of solutions to our state secretary, then this is your opportunity. This is that moment that will open the door uh, to your uh, career path, possibly. So if you're feeling, uh, if you're feeling this challenge, uh, please come on up to this podium, take a comfortable seat, chill out, and, um, and I will introduce to you the uh, next speaker. Uh, this is Peter Moy, and uh, Peter Moy uh, works in uh, youth care, and they're trying to develop creative, uh, practical solutions to make sure that, uh, that youth care is a less stressful job and environment. Uh, and this is an incredibly important uh, topic because there's a lot of kids out there, uh, and this is uh, about the ages 12 to 18, uh, and there's lots of kids out there do, who don't have the opportunity to grow up in a comfortable home where they have a mommy and a daddy that take care of them. What happens to these children? Well, very often they go to a state institution and they have people taking care of them and like teaching them everything they need to know. Um, and without this, uh, these, these children can't grow up to become healthy, uh, sensible adults. So it's super, super important, both for these kids as well as for society, that uh, this is uh, being done uh, well. Uh, so please give it up uh, for the very respectable Peter Moy. Thank you. Thank you, Attila. Welcome to the Stressless Challenge, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Moy, and together with uh, uh, Reynold, uh, uh, we're going to present to you what we want to offer you as a challenge for the next couple of um, days. So we have a 48-hour challenge. Uh, and uh, what we want to challenge you to is to think of new solutions. How can we use technology in healthcare institutions? How can we use ter uh, technologies, uh, wearables, uh, using biofeedback and designing great opportunities for uh, uh, young kids in these institutions, uh, whether it be games or apps or other uh, ways of communicating, interactive communication. Uh, where they can learn how to better manage their own stress levels. Uh, we're going to talk about that much more uh, later on, but first um, let us introduce to you the youth care institution where this is all about. So uh, please a uh, uh, warm welcome for uh, Reynold, uh, who's going to introduce himself and the institution first. Uh, good evening everybody, I'm Reynold van der Heide. I work at Spirit, um, which is a youth care uh, company or uh, foundation in Amsterdam. We work for the greater Amsterdam area. Um, Spirit is about foster care, um, assisted living, and part of Spirit is uh, also the coupling. And that's what the, the specific part of uh, Spirit that we're going to be talking about today. Um, the coupling is uh, Jeugdzorg Plus. I don't have a, an English uh, word for that. Um, and Jeugdzorg Plus is uh, saying as much as it is a treatment facility where children are being um, uh, uh, taken care of um, on judge's order. Uh, and it's not a criminal uh, order, not a criminal facts that I have uh, done uh, for which they are in, uh, in uh, the coupling. It is uh, for civil reasons, for behavioral reasons, sometimes to protect themselves from the environment, from people that are um, harming them or um, uh, able to harm them because they are very reliable uh, of them, reliant of them. Um, the coupling consists, consists of boys and girls, sometimes mixed, sometimes specifically boys and girls groups, uh, in the range of 12 to 18, but 12 is a little bit young, uh, most uh, of the um, uh, adolescents are 14 and older um, and in there they will be uh, they are treated um, in order to maintain themselves better in normal society um, their skills are uh, being trained and stuff um, the 
give you an idea of what the coupling looks like, um, this is uh, the specific colored part is the new part of the coupling. That part in the back is the older part. Um, and in both those facilities, uh, the children are being uh, um, are, are living, and uh, the new part is a little bit more open space area. Uh, it is allowed to exit the coupling uh, for some time during the day, um, and in the older part, it's more closed off and inside. Uh, and to be specific, this is like it, it is not a prison, but the doors will be locked, so it is not uh, you are not allowed to leave the coupling. Uh, just because you want to leave the coupling. You have to be guided by someone or you have to have specific um, uh, allowance or you have to be allowed specifically to leave the coupling. This is the olden part. This may look a little bit like a prison cell, a prison hall, um, and it's not very enticing, but on either side you see doors to rooms where uh, the children uh, have their own room, their own specific place. And in the new part, it looks a little bit more friendly. Um, but still, as you can see, there are uh, badges um, where you can open the door with a key card. And unfortunately, the, the kids in there don't get a key card. That's just for the counselors. Uh, this is one of the um, living rooms in uh, uh, one of the groups. And this is where they can socialize, you can watch TV. And they can eat and live and spend time together. And in the back there, you can see uh, an office where the counselors uh, do their jobs and have conversations with uh, the pupils. Yeah, could, maybe we can start a film, but the internet connection, as you might have noticed, is pretty bad. Um, so we're trying to do it through my phone, but I'm not sure if it's going to work. But we'll give it a try. So the, uh, this is an introduction by a 13-year-old girl who uh, lives or lived in the, in the coupling. And she made the introduction herself because of privacy reasons. You can't see her, but you can see the facility. And unfortunately, it's in Dutch since it's a Dutch girl in a Dutch institution. But you'll get a feel of what it, uh, what it looks like uh, living there for as long as it lasts. <laughs> yes, and that's pretty much <laughs> it. <Yeah. laughs> oh. No. Sorry, guys. Sorry. <laughs> we'll put it online. So if you join the challenge, we'll put it on the website and you can watch it afterwards. Uh. I believe it's on YouTube even. Yeah, so you can uh, find it on YouTube. Um, who are staying at the, uh, the coupling? Um, the coupling offers an integrated care and treatment aiming towards the young adult as well as their family. So um, even though the young uh, adult or the adolescents are inside the coupling, uh, the family, the parents, the friends, uh, brothers and sisters are not forgotten. They are um, um, invited over a lot and they are part of the treatment because whatever the ad adolescent learns, they should be able to um, um, do it in the real world as well, and they need to be supported by what they're doing because their behavior is going to change. They're going to learn certain tools, and they should be supported by the people they know and they live together with. <laughs> um, they should be supported by the people they live together with, and they should not be laughed at if they're uh, trying something out that they've learned in the coupling and uh, maybe someone is ridiculizing, ridicul ridiculizing them for doing that. Um, so everybody that is involved with the ad adolescent is also involved in the treatment. Um, inside, they live in groups of eight or six, and uh, they are being counseled 24 hours a day. That doesn't mean they have therapy 24 hours a day, but they are inside for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and all month and all year, if necessary. Um, the doors of their rooms are closed. They're not able to open them themselves. Um, and uh, um, in total for 2015, the coupling had 181 clients. And um, that will tell you that um, none of the adolescents will stay there for a year. Most programs will take about four to eight, maybe 10 months, uh, dependent on the adolescent. 
Um, and why are they there? Well, they are there because they suffer from severe behavioral problems, um, psychosocial problems, family problems, the system that is failing. The system is what we call in juvenile care is the family. The family is a system as a whole, and that system should support one another in order to make yourself uh, develop, develop in a, a, a better way than uh, uh, without it. Um, some children that are there are mentally challenged or uh, intelli intellectually challenged, and some have psychiatrical problems. And for most of the adolescents, it is a combination of problems. But these are the main factors. Um, the coupling aims to improve the problem-solving skills, uh, both inside and outside, so in a group and in, in functioning within schools, but also outside and with your family. Um, they improve school, sk school skills and results. Some children are, um, have been um, turning around their day and night cycle. They're living uh, during the night and sleeping during the day. And they, are, um, they have trouble following authority, listening to people that tell them to do something. Uh, and they don't accept people telling them to do something. So they have to learn that people will do that and will have to do that in order to uh, uh, function in society. Uh, improve their societal skills, improve their self-awareness. They should learn how to, how to view themselves, to be aware of themselves. You could, for instance, be conversing with someone that's yelling at you, and, when you uh, and, and sometimes they even yell at you and they scream at you, telling you to stop yelling when you're speaking normal and they're yelling. So they're not aware of the fact that they are yelling and that you're speaking normally. Um, and to improve the system. So the family system should be improved as well because these children are a result of their family, of their upbringing, like we all are. Uh, and in most cases that goes pretty well, but in some cases it doesn't. And in order to uh, improve the functioning of the adolescent, you should also improve the functioning of the system as a whole. Um, and if there is a, um, a case of disabilities, for instance, maybe ADHD or uh, uh, development uh, problems, uh, then that should be solved as well within the coupling by medication or by therapy. Uh, let's see. When it comes to stress and aggression, uh, the coupling has seen some things happen. Um, in 2015, overall, there were 618 incidents. Incidents are, will range from just swearing and threatening, which is pretty much daily life for people under the 18. Uh, up to violence, uh, physical violence, or even escapes. Uh, so the term incidents is a bit broad, um, but uh, uh, it is uh, um, within the coupling, a, a lot happens, and a lot happens almost every day. 54% of the incidents happened in the living facility, so in the rooms that you were seeing uh, before in the living room. Uh, other incidents uh, of other uh, places where incidents occur are in school or maybe outside in uh, the closed off area where they can be outside. And the most relative incidents we found uh, have happened in February, May and June. You might be able to figure out why that is. That is, uh, if, you, if I could take a guess, maybe February is behind, uh, is after all the holidays, the holidays where you are together with your families. Um, some of the adolescents may have been in arguments over the holidays and have not spoken to their families, maybe for, for a couple of weeks. And if you don't speak to your family and if you're, not in, if you're inside the coupling and you have no contact with your family, then you are not allowed out. You are not allowed to come at home, maybe because your parents don't want to. That'll build up aggression, that'll build up frustration, and that might be an indication why February is a busy month when it comes to incidents. May and June is the end of school, the start of summer holiday, and for children in the coupling, the difference between a school, um, a school week or a school month is not very much different uh, compared to a summer holiday month because they are inside, they are constricted, they are not allowed to go anywhere they want to. Um, so the difference between those things is uh, different and therefore may be a reason for them to be more frustrated. And uh, the times that it occurs are 12 to 1 in the afternoon, mostly at lunch, between school, and 8 to 9, but, but those are also the, the times that are often on the group. And um, around 9 is also the time that they have to go to their room, and th that, those are times that they pro probably will be 
more disobedient and more wanting to do what they want to do because they are pubers, uh, are in puberty, um, and therefore it is difficult for them. <laughs> it's difficult for them to uh, follow instruction. Um, in recent years, we found that uh, aggression is increasing uh, under uh, um, amongst the uh, adolescents, and uh, they aim their aggression both at the professionals as well as other adolescents. Um, we'll have some examples from uh, for what we uh, what happens. Um, more than half of all adolescents, 57 percent, are at some point involved in an accident. So that means that this particular group is of course not a regular group that you find outside. It is a particular group that is, there, there was a reason for them to be in the coupling. And um, almost or more than half of all these people inside the coupling will be involved in some kind of incident. So it's not actually more an incident, it's more like a, a regular occurrence. Uh, on average, an adolescent is involved in six incidents during his or her stay. Uh, that might seem a little bit much, but in most incidents, more than one adolescent is involved. Um, so therefore, it is more than uh, uh, you might think. Uh, to give you some examples of what might happen, um, there are six, I'm not going to name all of them. Um, but for instance, an adolescent says he doesn't like the rules, he refuses to remove his cap from his hat, which is a rule. Uh, later, he threatens to remodel the group, which is a fancy way of saying, I'm going to kick the shit out of everything. And uh, he starts kicking chairs, breaks the TV, and starts to threaten to break other things as well. The counselors make alarm. That's uh, uh, where everybody gets a signal. They have to come over to a specific place. And he's being detained. That means that some of the counselors will put him down with force and put him into his own room or maybe into a separation room where he can calm down and then later come out and discuss the, the things that happened. Um, but of course, if you are in a group with six to eight people and one of the adolescents is doing this, this is causing a lot of havoc, which mostly leads out to uh, there being some kind of tension on the group for several days after. Um, another one is that uh, an adolescent was emotional for not knowing when she can go home. This was around um, New Year's. Her parents were not clear on when she was allowed to come home, so she was anxious to go home, but she never knew if she could and if she, or if she couldn't. Um, so at night, she got so anxious in bed and that she broke her window, her room, and uh, she dared not escape because of the glass uh, on the floor. She had to jump down several levels, uh, so she didn't dare to do that. Um, but that might have been an escape from the coupling. Um, and for instance, uh, uh, a last uh, example, uh, an adolescent is swearing, is threatening on the group, doesn't want to go to school. Uh, he is sent to his room, so he does follow orders, luckily. After 10 minutes, he was able to talk about it and later sent to school. It doesn't seem like a really big incident, but that is the kind of behavior that in the coupling you are pretty much looking for. This is almost close to normal behavior for, uh, for adolescents. They can, um, uh, they can uh, cry out, they can uh, overreact to something, but in a couple of uh, minutes or uh, after some time of cooling down, they can come back and relax. Um, and that is maybe one of the better in, uh, examples of um, what we're trying to uh, prevent and what the challenge is, that you try to learn these uh, students how to cope with their emotions, with their aggression, with their feelings, um, like we all are. For instance, if, if I'm in a car and someone's cutting me off, I can be really angry. And if someone is seeing me getting angry, that could go get out of hand real quickly. Um, so therefore, it is really a, a, a great lesson for all, but especially for uh, adolescents in the coupling, to be able to cope with stress, with aggression, with uh, really strong feelings coming up suddenly. Um, and that's what this challenge is about. Um, so, uh, for short, uh, and to cut off my, uh, my part, um, our challenge is that can you find a way to make young adults in the coupling more relaxed using technology and thus create safer youth care? Um, there is a lot of stress for adolescents in juvenile institutions like the coupling, and there are a lot of institutions like the coupling in the Netherlands. Uh, we would like to use technology to help adolescents deal with stress better. Um, or maybe, just to give you an idea, or not focusing fully on uh, the adolescents, maybe also the counselors need to handle their own stress better. How stressful is it for the counselors to work with 
such stress that can explode every time, every day, every day of your work. Um, well, it's up to you. Um, Erik. So now that you have a better idea of what this challenge is about, um, I was just wondering, since we're here at Campus Party, um, any of you are, uh, which, uh, which ones of you uh, like uh, designing uh, creative things, so who, are, uh, who feel that, uh, as themselves as creatives? Uh, which of you think, uh, oh, I'd like to really design beautiful things, for example, for this challenge, uh, uh, to, to design great games or uh, things that they can use in the, the, uh, the healthcare institution? And uh, who are, sorry. Great. Who likes to make useful things? <laughs> Who's really interested in using new technologies? Uh, things like uh, wearables, uh, biofeedback devices, um, using um, artificial intel intelligence. Last night on this stage there was someone from IBM telling us how machine learning can help uh, us uh, uh, build computers that can really basically do whatever we're doing now now as humans and they can take that over for us so maybe uh, something with real cool technology could really help uh, these children better uh, learn about themselves who's into technology who's into uh, design uh, in de designing great tech okay great so I'm trying to show you how we want to challenge you to use both of these uh, uh, these uh, insights to to build uh, things to help the coupling uh, give better care to these children, to these young people. So the challenge is to uh, find a way to um, help them cope with stress. And I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about how we want to enable you to uh, come up with new ideas. It's a challenge for me as well, since I was hoping to uh, show you a little of, uh, of our insights uh, using YouTube. <laughs> and uh, weird as it may seem here on uh, a campus party, uh, I'm not, uh, not able to, uh, to get them all working, so I'm trying to describe a little of the things that I was uh, trying to show you on the, on the video. So the first thing is, um, this is a video that you can see afterwards on the, on the uh, challenge website as well. But the uh, interesting uh, thing is first, there are quite a few insights in how the brain works um, how stress can build up and how can, uh, stress can lead to aggression. And um, there are also uh, quite a few uh, known ways from psychology that people can use to deal with stress. So there's a lot of insights in how stress builds up, but also how you can uh, build stress down if you are aware of the fact that you are stressed out and that you're feeling more aggressive. Uh, most of the times people don't realize it until they actually have a, a, like a blowout to someone or have an, have an uh, incident, as uh, it is called in youth care. Um, but if you can uh, find out what, what are the triggers for you, uh, how stress builds up in your particular situation, then you can act and, and use uh, that knowledge to really uh, better get a grip of yourself, better get control of yourself. So a few of the things that we want to use in this uh, challenge and we want to give you to, uh, to uh, experiment with are tools that can help either uh, find out if you're stressed or uh, uh, help manage your stress. So one of the technologies that uh, we have with us here is the, is the Muse, which is an EEG scanner and a headband that you put on your head and that measures uh, brain activity. And brain activity can be a really good way to uh, cope with um, uh, emotions. So if you want to, for example, try to be more relaxed, you can use the Muse to uh, further build down your anxiety, your arousal, and then uh, be become more aware and more relaxed of, of um, uh, and better deal with your emotions. Uh, another technology which is quite new, uh, we have a few of them for this challenge, a few of them available for this challenge, is the Totem, which is a uh, wearable device that can do a lot of things that uh, an Apple Watch could do as well or some of the um, uh, Fitbit or other devices that you can uh, buy in the store. But it's a really uh, really cheap and flexible device which is really easily programmable and you can do a lot of things with them yourself. They're easy to hack, basically. And these devices um, um, uh, have a different set of um, sensors that you can use if you want to um, 
uh, help these young people in the in the uh, youth care institutions to find out better better find out what their daily routines are and uh, uh, find a little bit more out about their own health and their uh, uh, their activities so you could use that also to find a solution and the third one which is probably the most interesting thing is the uh, empathica it's one of the few devices uh, that can really accurately measure stress and uh, give you uh, feedback on stress levels. It measures uh, stress through your skin, so you wear it, and uh, it measures uh, uh, electricity through your skin, and the output is quite accurate. So if you want a device like, if you go out running and you have a GPS tracker, then you can measure meter by meter uh, how far you have gone. And this is basically something that does the same for stress. It's a very accurate uh, device that measures uh, levels of stress uh, so accurately that you could actually like make predictions as to when someone is going to get an argument or when someone is going to break down or uh, maybe even um, um, build up a depression over a longer time of uh, period of time. So this device really gives you a lot of insight in the psychology of someone. And if you can use that that feedback and build a great application around that, a very functional or a very beautiful one, uh, then uh, you could make something that really could indicate to someone um, how they're feeling and at what time they should do something else to not get aggressive or uh, get stressed out. So a little bit about the, the emotion uh, and technology. Um, using technology to uh, work with your emotions. There's actually a great video behind this image <laughs> about uh, someone from MIT explaining how they did experiments with um, young children. They put a wristband just like the other one around uh, the children's uh, wrists and they measured their anxiety levels, their arousal levels while watching a cartoon. I think it was uh, Minions or something. So they measured the uh, anxiety levels during the movie and you could actually see what part of the movie they liked best. Because emotions aren't just stress and anxiety and, and fear, but uh, emotions can also be uh, a joy and, uh, and happiness. So you can use these insights really to really accurately pinpoint how people are feeling and also what kind of pattern there is in, uh, in this um, uh, build-up. So to wrap it up, um, you heard uh, Raymond tell you about uh, how life is in the institutions. I've shown you a little bit about the technologies that we uh, want to give you to use to, to try out new ways of communicating with these children, ab children about their emotion. Um, and basically, um, as Ronald was, Ronald was saying, we want, you to, we want to challenge you to build great new uh, ideas about how to um, uh, help them manage their own anxieties and stress and fears. We want to uh, help you understand stress better the next couple of uh, hours and days. We want you to find out uh, how we can use these technologies or how you can use these technologies to really design great new ways to reduce stress and hopefully, I mean it's only 48 hours, but still hopefully prototype a great new tool that one of you in the end, can uh, then um, present to our uh, Secretary of State, uh, Dutch Secretary of State, who is very uh, um, interested in helping youth care, uh, and especially incarcerated youth care, help them uh, develop more. So we, uh, the best idea, we can help you uh, set up a meeting with him so you can present your idea to him. Um, of course, the most important thing, naturally, is that we can help them, uh, we can help your solution become a part of the youth care system and help uh, a lot of kids in these institutions uh, have a better life there. Um, Spirits and the coupling also reserve money for the best idea to be uh, prototyped further and, uh, and tested out in the institutions. So we have that as well. And uh, uh, last but not least, since this might be a very stressful uh, events uh, next coming of a uh, couple of days especially if you're going for the head main prize is that we want to offer you a uh, time to relax afterwards so we offer a weekend away uh, well it could be it could be any city depending on what kind of nationalities you have in your team we'll figure that out what might be the best look uh, destination for your trip then but uh, 
I hope you are uh, enthusiastic about the, uh, about the topic. I hope that you feel that you can uh, make a difference for, these, uh, uh, for this institution, for these uh, kids. And um, uh, uh, next up, if you decide to join us in the challenge, we're going to talk to you a, a little bit more also about behavior design. We're going to tell you how the challenge is going to work. Uh, we're going to have a great workshop afterwards with uh, Jens Schijbels there in the back and Tom Wolvers, who are going to show you um, how, to, um, how to think like a designer and um, hack like a pro and build great things the next couple of days. And uh, we definitely hope that uh, uh, you're planning on uh, joining the challenge and uh, making great applications for this, uh, um, for this very serious problem. Good luck. Good luck with the challenge. Afterwards, um, uh, Jens and Tom will take it over. Uh, we're going to start with uh, the planning for this, uh, for this uh, 48 hour hackathon for this challenge. Um, but not before we take any questions that you might have about uh, what's coming up next. Thank you. Is there anything that you want to, anything that you want to know about the challenge or uh, questions that you have about any particular part of this? Are you feeling up for this? Uh, how do you feel? Want to join the challenge and build great things uh, the next couple of uh, days? Jens, can you come to the stage? <laughs> then we can uh, talk about uh, how we can set up the workshop and uh, get this challenge going. <laughs> I think we just have to switch laptops and then we can continue, uh, continue the show. Just out of curiosity, um, uh, what kind of, which countries are you from, uh, uh, who are from South America here? Welcome, great to have you over. Um, uh, Holland? Yeah, a lot. Um, um, uh, other countries in Europe? Spain, Spain, Spain. very good, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, Asia? Yeah, welcome as well. Any uh, continent that I forgot? <laughs> no? Well, so much, uh, so, uh, so happy to have you all here. Welcome uh, at the challenge. Um, Jens setting up himself and uh, <laughs> to start off uh, with the workshop afterwards. Is there anyone who has any um, um, a knowledge of youth care institutions in your own country? People that you know of who have been there? Is this, um, is this a story that, that you recognize from that? Or is there anyone who says this is very uh, familiar? I have heard stories about these institutions. Uh, yeah, special education. Uh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And these are very special stories uh, from uh, from these uh, kids. Yeah, yeah. Just checking how far uh, Jens is. <laughs> Switching the microphone. Good. <laughs> So, uh, uh, as I was saying afterwards, um, we'll have some topics that we want to discuss with you, things that we think might help you uh, work on this challenge uh, and uh, design things that really could help the young people in these institutions further. So, we're uh, going to uh, share with you a, a, a few insights about... <laughs> That's you. <laughs> share with you some insights on uh, how you can uh, start this design process, thinking about what might work in, best in, uh, in youth care institution, and um, also uh, a little bit of psychology, how uh, behavior design works. So for example, if you use the Empatica, you use the wearable to uh, design new, um, uh, new applications, how can you use biofeedback to trigger different emotions, different behaviors? 
So if you, for example, think about building a game, how can you use biofeedback to trigger different emotions? So there's a lot of insight in that field as well, and we hope that you find a way to use that uh, as well, because it might be a really powerful way to use that. I think I should be on a different point of the stage. Uh, can help you design uh, solutions that really can help these uh, children um, get into different states, different emotions, and uh, uh, basically feel much better using these solutions. So very uh, curious as to uh, what you might uh, come up with the next couple of days. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Jens. Welcome. Thanks to, uh, thanks to have you over here, and uh, good luck. And welcome. And uh, Tom, will you be joining me? No? You, uh, you will smile and wave. Tom is in the back. He's, uh, he's my partner in crime these days. Um, and I learned a new key. That's the B. That means it's coming from, bl from black to a screen again we can use. Okay, the idea is that you heard the case. It's kind of um, a challenging case because it's about healthcare. And in healthcare, it's always about people. And people are nice objects like you guys, but it's always difficult to design for them because they have, they have a specific way of looking at the world. Um, so we have some guiding tools to start today. And we want to walk you through what the idea is of a 48-hour challenge. It's not a lot of time, but the time we do have, how we're going to spend it. Um, so the idea is that in 48 hours, you can come up with great ideas, and the better they are, the more there's to win. So that's kind of a nice challenge already. Um, in basic, well, be, by the way, these are the things we, we might be using, websites, Slack, and of course, Twitter if you want to, or Facebook. Um, but we're going to do a 48 hour meaningful challenge. Um, and it means that we're looking for intervention that potentially ha uh, have, the uh, have the ability to change people's behavior. And I'm kind of careful in saying that because we cannot say I will change your behavior, but we can invite people to change behavior. So we see something happening now, and there's a reason people are doing that today. And we think we can go into something else where we can say what happens if we plug this into your life, will you behave differently then? Are we solving things? Are we changing things for the better? Hopefully we are. As designers, we hope to, or we believe that we can do things better. But as a catch, you know, why do we and all other designers today want to change behavior so badly? Uh, I'm not sure if you have thought about this, like, because designers, we're changing, and I'm saying designers because I'm coming from a design background, but in, but in development, we see the same thing. Now, when I was educated, I was taught to do things like this. Objects need to be fun, need to be cool looking, they need to be very nice and nice material. This is what we were designed for as, 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 as persons. Uh, and things like this, nice lamps, but we're not doing that anymore. I think today, we designers are changing. Um, and we're changing from solely designing objects to doing something else. We're now designing intervention that would help people to be more sustainable, uh, to eat more healthy to be more supportive in the local community. And these things do not require a table or a chair. These things require something else. So what do we want to do as designers? We want to have these things happening. And that is something difficult. Um, it means that, that we uh, need interventions that change the way we behave and not the way we select or buy a product. So we're looking for something else, this, this challenge. We're looking for ideas that are not meant to be impressive when seen in a, in a window shop. It, it, it needs to be in, in a shop. Uh, it needs to be impressive because it has impact on our daily lives. And especially with a target group like introduced before, it's challenging. So we're going to use some ideas on how can we help people to understand what's happening, use the available information, and we're going to add to that because using the new technology, we can have more input than before. Um, and how we're going to use the input that we gained to invite people to change their behavior. How we're going to allow people to do that. That's our challenge these weeks. And uh, of course, you can expect, in my opinion, in a few years, uh, innovators or designers will be asked to design for world peace. And even better, we will succeed. Uh, and we're going to show you how to do the design process in that way. We're starting today with, with uh, uh, the pitch already. But of course, tomorrow and the day after, we're going to guide you through. So we're following a design process that is um, uh, mainly based on IDEO's approach to human-centered design. Uh, I'm not sure if we're used to that. Some of you might say, of course, we do that all the time. Some of you might say, we haven't done it before. Um, for either groups, we're, we're kind of using uh, the same uh, material, but I do think that if you're used to it, we can, of course, be more quicker in how to apply it. 
Um, we're offering this one because it's a free download, and we think that after this challenge, because it's, of course it's a short challenge, you can still use the material easily, uh, and that's something that we want to have. So, of course, about a challenge for now, you know, and, and getting to the trip abroad, but we also want to apply you with ideas and methods used later on. So these are the three steps we're going to go through in, in the three days. Today mainly is about inspiration, and inspiration does not only mean being inspired, but also being informed, knowing what the case is about, what is happening, what can you learn about the technology and about the people in your situation. And afterwards we go to ideation, coming up with new ideas and try to make a change with them. And of course, last one, implementation is difficult. Can you build it or shall we just prepare it for being pitched to a client? So roughly going through the days as we're going to, to get them. Today is mainly about understanding inspiration. So what's the deeper understanding of the case? Who is your client? Uh, who is your user? What's the physical social context? And of course, what's the potential of our technology? Because uh, in Campus Party, we love to embrace technology and we're gonna use it to make the world better. That's our aim. Then tomorrow, we're gonna build more ideation and concepting. That means that we're gonna start, and of course, if we can start earlier, that's brilliant, but let's say tomorrow, uh, start building a huge amount of ideas and create strong concepts, actually do the trick for us. And that is a long process. And again, we will guide you through as we go. But Saturday is the most important day because we invite you to build something tangible, to build a prototype. And let's, get, let's see how far we can get. Let's see how much we can do in, in 48 hours. Uh, and I think it's more than we can imagine. So let's try to aim for a tangible or at least experienceable prototype. So something that you can use to explain your concept in a way that is easy to understand. So if the client is here, and people who are interested are, are visiting, can you explain to them how your concept is working? And then not just with a story or with a render, but with a tangible prototype. Let's see how far we can get with that. That's for Saturday mainly. And if all goes well, of course, as mentioned before, there's a 5,000 euro development budget and a trip abroad. Um, I, I've, I've heard whispering about some cool cities in Europe, but of course, that's the city where you're living. We're not sending you back home. <laughs> We're gonna help you to a better city. So this is, uh, I think, a nice, uh, incentive to try to see how far we can get in 48 hours. And then there's this difficult one, uh, especially with having prices and having a jury and having a client with high demands. What do you need to do? Uh, there's a list, and I, I don't want to scare you away, but just as a guideline, um, these are some of the things that we would like to see. Um, of course, they fit for the client's and the user's needs. Think about privacy, uh, think about durability. Of course, it's sometimes a very rough environment. How are we gonna design for this? Um, it needs to be inviting, it needs to be understood very easily. Uh, maybe we should avoid text, and I say maybe because it's allowed to work in Dutch, but if you're not Dutch, then it is difficult. Of course, we'll help you out, but let's see if you can avoid it. Visually attractive is something that is mainly common in design, so I'm not sure that's even a deliverable. I think it's more a way of thinking in our world, so you're probably safe there. And scalability and affordability means that if it's only fit for one person and it costs a million euros, I don't think it's a viable ID. So let's see also there, uh, how far can we go if it's, if it's about making a concept that's actually interesting for the client, it, it helps people away, it persuades people to change their way of thinking, and if that all works and we can still scale it, that's what we're looking for. So our idea is to stay close to each other for now, so the ones who will be starting, please uh, stay close in the beginning, let's have a good check-in, let's see who's working with us, and uh, we'll be here around 11 today, and uh, uh, to go step-by-step step with you guys on this process, and tomorrow at 11, in, at 11 o'clock in the morning, we'll have a check-in for uh, the next round, so just to guide you through and give you some extra check-in moments, so we, won't, don't, won't, we don't want you to get lost in the space and be nowhere and be confused, will be close and will be around uh, as much as necessary. Um, and with having that said, m I think the aim is really to just, and it's almost like Disney, let's create magic and change the world for the better. Um, as I said before, these are the things you can find us on. So the ones doing the challenge, uh, uh, please stay around and I would like to invite you to, uh, to take it on the challenge. So uh, welcome, most welcome. And thank you for now. <laughs>